teachers of love, to help us read the parables that taught us to make good choices. Oh, but Lord, Lord, your son Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life upon the cross of Calvary, and through his death, sin is conquered once and for all. Through his resurrection, we have hope for eternal life. Lord, we praise you. Hear now, O oh Lord, our songs, our hymns, our prayers. Be with us as we share your living word. Recharge our physical, our spiritual batteries, O oh Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to yearn to continue to faithfully follow you. Help us to build our faith, build our love. Thank you for, for forgiving us of our sins and shortcomings. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Our prayer to Jesus. Amen. If convenient, will you stand with me as I sing our opening hymn? Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. The beautiful city of God. 
by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. A few announcements this morning as we come together. We have our Aftershock Youth tonight. That's from 5 to 6.30 for our 6th through 12th graders. And then we have Groove Crew in the morning from 8 to 10. And then we have Tuesday. Um, we will have no jam this week at all. So no jam on Tuesday. No Bible study on Wednesday. That's been changed. We're going to have it, but we're not. So no, no jam Tuesday. No Bible study Wednesday. No jam Thursday. Um, we're closing all things down so they can get the get the roofing done and not us not be in anybody's way. And there'll be no no danger to anybody. So they're going to come in on Tuesday morning. They're going to bring the cranes and park all the equipment out here in this parking lot. They plan to get up there Tuesday as soon as they deliver it all. They plan to be done by Friday, but said they would work Saturday if need be. The only thing that would stop them if we got rain next week, and that's not supposed to happen. So, pray, pray for good weather this week. Uh, there is a packing party today. Why don't you come talk to us about that? Really? Yeah. Okay. Come on. Come on. Yay! Because yeah. I, I love the excitement. That's the best. Woo! It's finally here. So, we have our first packing party today. We're going to be packing shoeboxes full of goodies and Bible study materials for children around the world, and it's your opportunity to come and join us, be part of this special project to spread the word of God to the ends of the world, of the earth. It is today and November the 5th, November the 12th, from 2 to 4, and it is come and go. So if you only have 30 minutes to spare, come and spend 30 minutes and be blessed by our ministry of the Operation Christmas Child. Amen. Okay, and so somebody asked the other day, can they still give money? Can they still bring yes, items? Yes, I mean, how, what's yes. best? Is money best? Is items best? What's best? What's best is what their heart tells them. Okay, perfect. Perfect. All right. Okay, we don't have any kiddos up here this morning. I think they're all downstairs eating breakfast. So um, let's go to the Lord in prayer for our offerings. The, the plates are on the side and the boxes at the back. So let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this beautiful day. That while the rain falls outside and your earth gets a bath, Lord God, we thank you for your presence here with us. That we woke up this morning and had the opportunity, Lord God, to worship you. So whether we're here in this place or watching in our homes or whether we are watching and went somewhere else to church, Lord God, it doesn't matter. The focus and the matters is that we have our attention set on you today. And so, God, be with us in this time. Be with us. Let your presence reside in this place. And, God, as we come together to look at, at what it means to be alive in your word, God, we are praying that you would raise us up, God, to, to step into the ministries you've called us to, whether that be Operation Christmas Child or Sunday School or Celebrate Friendship or Jam or wherever it is you're calling us, God, to spread your word. May we do it with boldness, and may we do it, God, with the power of the Holy Spirit that you have given us. God, we ask as we come and, and give those tithes, those offerings that you ask of us, those blessings that you have given us, God. We pray that as we give back, we do so as cheerful givers, God, giving from the heart all that we have to give you. God, we pray that they be multiplied to benefit your kingdom and the people of God you have called us to serve. God, we do all of this as we join together as as brothers and sisters in Christ, we pray the prayer that your Son and our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If it's convenient, won't you stand? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him.
Yeah. Okay. 
I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Amen. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we look at this story today, may our eyes be open to it in a new way. May you take this message, let it be your words, and lay it on our hearts exactly the way each and every one of us need to hear it today. Speak, Lord God, your words of hope, your words of revival, and your words of salvation. We ask all this in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So to me, there is no other prophet that has such surreal experiences as Elijah. You think back in, the, in that chapter, Ezekiel first wants the kingdom of Judah of coming judgment. Then he sees these visions of the Lord's glory departing from the temple. He continues to, to exhort the people of Judah to repent, to repent of their sins. And then he prophesies against other nations. After Jerusalem's fall, Ezekiel speaks to the nation's travails and their future restoration. And then the most unusual chapter of all about the nation's restoration is the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, and it is quite surreal. Imagine that picture that you're standing there where God has placed you in this vision of dry bones, a very strange place that God has taken Ezekiel. God brought him to this valley. This vision is terrible to me and frightening, maybe one of the most frightening ones in all of Scripture. It was covered with bones. If only someone could have put a camera in Ezekiel's hand. But this was not some Hollywood horror movie. This is what God was showing him. And so without a camera, Ezekiel begins to paint this picture with his words. And this bizarre nature of what he saw and what he heard. Uh, he goes on to talk about he hears these bones rattling, coming together. And he sees this vast army begin to stand up and come to life. The sounds, the lights, the motion and emotion of what God showed him. This is the picture that Ezekiel paints for us and how there's nothing but bones scattered in this valley. Ezekiel looks at the bones and as he looks to the left, he sees a crushed skull inside the helmet. And he looks to the right and he sees this bony hand still holding on to a rusty sword. He looks out and he sees that the bones have been picked clean by the birds of the air and the predators of the ground. And it doesn't say that the bones were just dry. It says they, they've been washed by the rains, they've been bleached by the sun, and they're baked and very, very Y'all, this is not a new battleground that had happened. This is not some new occurrence. This is years and years, maybe decades, that these bones had laid on this valley floor. So he sees this dreaded valley, this pile of lifeless bones. His heart had to have dropped when God stands him and places him in this valley. What an assignment. 
God gave to him. We have no reason to doubt the fact that God had placed him there for a reason. But can you just imagine how devastating and disheartening that must have been for Ezekiel? As he looked over these bones, he could probably think back to a time that those bones did represent some kind of ambition. This great battle that they were fighting, they fought for a reason, right? They represented some awareness. They knew what they were fighting for, and they represented activity. They were there for a purpose. They were there for a reason. At one time, they represented life and hope and future. But now, they were no more vibrant. They were no more alive, and they were no more doing anything good. No ambition, no awareness, no activity. Think carefully about that scene. You imagine Ezekiel. He's the only one who has any form of life in that place. He's the only one that is standing there physically anyway. He's the only one that is standing there. And I have to imagine that when he finds the courage to do something, he probably had to regain his soul because as he stands there, he was terrified. Terrified. I imagine he never thought he would be in a place like this. And God didn't tell him. God didn't tell him that it would be easy, right? So he had to find the courage to face this scary and impossible task. He was at a place of impossibility that defied human reasoning. No life, no chance, no hope, right? He needed a miracle. He needed God to invade this boneyard. That's what he needed. As Ezekiel stood there, I have to wonder that he, if he didn't think, I don't know what I'm doing here, but he was just an observer. He didn't say anything. He just told God, only you know. Only you know. As Ezekiel stood there, God said, mortal, can these bones live? Ezekiel answered the only way he knew to answer, Lord God, only you know. Now, keep in mind, God was not asking for information. He was not asking for this question to be answered, which means when he asks some type of rhetorical question, God's up to something, right? We're about to see something big when God starts asking rhetorical questions. So God was letting Ezekiel know from the, that very moment he was going to do something, and Ezekiel's only response could be, Lord, only you know. Only you know what's going to happen. The Valley of the Dry Bones teaches us that there is no person too far for being saved. There is no place too hard for God to revive. Remember that as you look at these places on the news and as you see what's happening in our world, there is no one for, too hard for God to save. And there is no place too hard for God to revive. So then God tells Ezekiel what to do. He's going to give him the solution because only God can raise up these bones. Only God. So what Ezekiel had to do was follow the command. That was it. God was telling him every single word to say. You stand there. You prophesy and you say this, this, and this. And as Ezekiel stood there looking out against these dry bones, y'all have to say, that had to be a horrible situation and people to preach to, right? He wasn't getting any amens from that crowd that day, right? The only hope of anything happening in that valley was found in his answer. Lord God, only you know. You know held the key to something great that was about to happen. Ezekiel knew that he couldn't bring those bones back together. He knew that only God knew what was about to happen. Only God could do something. See, those people who need a miracle that say, well, if God can't do it, nobody can. Instead, they should be saying, only God can do this, and that's who I'm going to rely on. But they've lost their faith in what God can do. Instead of totally expecting something great from God, they lose a little bit of their faith because they see doubt from the world's eyes. We know that God is the God of impossible. Just read the Bible. God is the God of impossible. So Ezekiel knew God could do something for these bones. And when God spoke to Ezekiel, Ezekiel repeated every single word, raising his voice with this sense of urgency that something was about to happen. See, Ezekiel knew these bones didn't need a lecture. They needed life. Ezekiel knew that these bones needed to be sermonized. They needed to be revitalized. Ezekiel knew his opinion in the situation did not matter. 
He just needed a word from God. Now hear me when I say this and grasp hold of the truth. If you are praying for someone, if you have a family member or a friend or, or a person that you know and you are trying to revive them and introduce them to God, you cannot do it if you are dead in spirit. You cannot do it if you don't have this awakening inside of you and you are relying on the word of God because life generates life. Life gives power. We know there's life in the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word quick here means alive. The word of God is alive. There is life in this book. Amen. There is life in it. And when the word is proclaimed, life manifests itself. You imagine as Jesus stood there and said, Lazarus, come forth. Life was manifested. When Jesus stood there and spoke to the little girl and said, little girl, arise. Life was manifested. When Jesus said, I will return in three days. Life was manifested on that first Easter morning. God never promised Ezekiel that he was going to get a response from the bones. He never told him he could get a response. All he knew was that God was commanding him to proclaim. And that's all he did. The words of the Lord were given to him. God was doing something, and because Ezekiel obeyed God's command, life was manifested. The revival of the dry bones signified God's plan for Israel's future restoration. It signified. The vision also, most importantly, showed that Israel's new life depended on God's power and not the circumstances of her people. That is shown to us. Putting breath by God's Spirit brings new life into the bones and shows that God would not only restore them physically, but also spiritually. That's what it shows us. God calls us as Christians to proclaim the life-giving Word of God. To all he has entrusted to us. To your corner of the kingdom. Wherever God's placed you. Work, home, family, strangers, wherever, whenever, whoever. It's the whole going to the ends of the earth thing. You know that thing? We don't come and build shoe boxes and send them to the other side of the world just so we can feel better about ourselves and get a pat on the back, right? That is not why we do it. We hold those boxes. We pray over those boxes. We pray for those children they're going to. Because I promise you, God knows every child is going to get every single box. Of the thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of boxes that are sent, God knows each and every child is going to get their hands on that very box, and he knows exactly what they need. That's the God we serve. And he said, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to all creation. We just don't send the box with just toys in it to keep them busy. We send it with the power of the Holy Spirit to filtrate into their lives. That's what we give them. So they will know they are loved. They will know that someone created them. And hopefully that will transform their life. So if you have a family member or a friend who does not seem interested in Christianity, it's okay. God can still work through them. And God will often use you to bring him to them. So whenever you lose hope, whenever you begin to see despair on the evening news, or whenever you worry about tomorrow, just rest assured, there is no valley you stand in that God does not stand with you and that God cannot restore. God can raise up dry bones. We, as his people, just have to follow the command and expect something great. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we tend to forget what power that you have placed within us. And even more so, we forget that you have equipped us to use it for your glory. Not for the things we think we should see in life. Not for the people we think should do certain things. But God, for your glory. So help us today, right here, right now, to stir up the dry bones that may be within us. Revive our bone yards, Lord God. Bring life into the places that we have let go away. God, fill us with your power. And allow us to call ourselves to come alive so that we may be helpful and able and ready to speak life and resurrection to others in your name. Thank you, Lord God, for trusting us and for inviting us into this incredible work of ministry that goes to the ends of the world. We ask that we be good stewards of that ministry and of the calling you have placed on this body of Christ. We ask all this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. If it's convenient, won't you 
stand with me for our closing hymn? There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each